Hello and, and welcome to this uh, webinar uh, promoted by the Dialysis Outcome and Practice Pattern Study, the DOPS. Today we will be discussing anemia manage, uh, management across the spectrum of CDD, challenges and evolving conditions. It is a, a great pleasure for me, Roberto Pequafilio, I'm a nephrologist and a senior research scientist here at the uh, Arbor Research to welcome everybody. Um, I will um, start by just um, uh, going through the topics for today. The speakers will be presented as we move forward with the program, uh, but we will have two talks by Bruce Robinson and Stephen Fishbane, and then uh, a round uh, table discussion with our guests uh, from across the globe um, and uh, we will have a, a list of um, renowned um, specialists in the area of anemia and, C uh, and CKD providing insights uh, really from a global perspective. This activity is supported by an educational grant from AstraZeneca, uh, and Arbor Research is fully responsible for the scientific content of the webinar. As a reminder, uh, today's uh, webinar will be recorded. And available um, right after the event on our GoToStage channel. These are the learning objectives. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but they really describe what we will see today during our discussions. As a reminder, uh, participants of uh, today's events are eligible to CME credits through our partner, the National Kidney Foundation. And um, right after the event, you will receive an email with instructions on how to claim your CME credits. We wanted this session to be very interactive, so please um, ask your questions through the Q&A function on the top right screen of your uh, computer. And um, the Q&A function will be available throughout the whole session. Feel free to post your comment or ask your questions. We'll make sure to address that um, live or through the chat box. Also, um, join the conversation on social media. Um, uh, Docs is uh, present in Twitter. Uh, so follow us in the Twitter handle at Docs Study and use for tweets about today's presentation the hashtag Docs for um, following up with the um, with the subject of today's presentation. So please feel free to um, broadcast, you know, and, and advertise in, in our social media channels. Okay, so um, for today's uh, first presentation, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Bruce Robinson, uh, a nephrologist and uh, epidemiologist who uh, leads the uh, study as a scientific direct director. Bruce is a renowned uh, specialist and has published extensively in this area and today will be providing an overview of the observational data on how we are managing uh, anemia in CKD and uh, some of the some of uh, insights of uh, you know reasons for why uh, some of the um, under achievements or targets and objectives are present. So with that, I'll just pass it to Bruce. Bruce, take it away. Well, hello, and thank you so much for your attendance. My name is Bruce Robinson, the DOPS program scientific director. Uh, we're, you know, after three decades of managing anemia of CKD with uh, ESA therapy and with iron, we are now finally at a crossroads um, with the potential addition of a, a really exciting new class of medications, the HIF proteolyl hydroxylase inhibitors. 
And at this moment, uh, we thought it would make sense for us to take stock uh, of what's going on in the real world. Uh, you know, how we're doing with anemia care and really what are the challenges uh, that are faced by nephrologists uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the talk today will, will include a lot of data from the DOPS program and here are the uh, acknowledgements of uh, DOPS funders. All right, the outline of the talk. Uh, first of all, in the non-dialysis space, uh, how often uh, are anemia and iron stores measured? What are those distributions? What are targets? Uh, how often is anemia treated? Uh, and what more do we need to know about hemoglobin and outcomes? Then in the dialysis space, really focused on the need to improve care in the dialysis transition period. Uh, we'll note that patients are getting a lot of ESA and IV iron right after starting dialysis. A couple of comments regarding prevalent patients and as well on, on anemia care in the perineal dialysis setting. All right, the DOPS program is currently in 19 countries. We'll focus on data from our CK DOPS study of advanced CKD in the US, Brazil, France, and Germany. And then in our hemodialysis study, I'll be comparing the US to Japan to seven uh, different European countries. All right, first topic then is in the advanced CKD space. Uh, how often do we measure uh, anemia uh, parameters and what do those distributions all right, with this graphic, first of all, a reminder in yellow text boxes that the KDGO most recent guide, anemia guidelines are from 2012 suggest that CKD 3, 5, 3 to 5 patients with anemia have hemoglobin measured at least every three months. Defining anemia as hemoglobin less than 13 for, for men and postmenopausal women, less than 12 for premenopausal women, and uh, looking at the data, x-axis shows months since first since the first hemoglobin measurement and the time to the next uh, on the y-axis uh, among patients even with a hemoglobin less than 10 which is in blue only about 50 percent of persons have hemoglobin measured uh, within three months it's actually comparable across the three uh, strata of hemoglobin distributions shown Moving then to frequency of measurement of uh, iron uh, indices uh, here TSAT and ferritin just to remind folks, KDGO 2012 uh, doesn't give clear guidance, but rather uh, notes that, that uh, frequency of measurement really is going to vary based on ESA use, uh, hemoglobin trend, uh, et cetera. In that context, we see here across our three, uh, three CK DOPS countries that uh, in the dark blue, which is actually refers to no measurement within six months uh, uh, surrounding a hemoglobin measure, and we'll see actually in the U.S., hemoglobin less than 10, actually 47% uh, or nearly half of patients actually have no measures within six months of a hemoglobin. So a lot of anemic patients, particularly in the U.S., really don't have frequent enough measurement of iron stores. And then moving on now here to distributions of uh, hemoglobin level that here by CKD stage uh, within our four CKDOPS countries, uh, as no, no surprise to anybody that the, the prevalence of anemia rises uh, as, as does stage. Uh, what might be surprising is, is exactly how common anemia is. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, we see, for example, just looking at the U.S. on the very right-hand side, 75% of patients with CKD stage 5 have hemoglobin under 12, and uh, over 30% of hemoglobin less than 10 uh, now these data, these findings are corroborated by a number of other studies, and I've listed just a few here uh, in, within the Medicare uh, older uh, U.S. Uh, adult population, also uh, commercial payer population, as well as ANHANES uh, uh, data, uh, all show the similar uh, prevalence of, uh, very high prevalence of, of anemia. Moving on then to prevalence of iron deficiency. Uh, here I'm combining across our, our CKDOPS countries uh, and showing it by both CKD stage and hemoglobin level. And the simple message here is that iron deficiency is remarkably common if we choose the definition of, of either ferritin less than 100 or TSAT less than 20%, that is the sum of all three of these um, um, bars, prevalence is essentially around 50%. And it also varies a little by CKD stage or hemoglobin level. 
And again, we find corroborative data in the literature with NAN showing actually yet, yet higher prevalence of uh, 60 to 70 percent uh, of iron deficiency in the CKD setting. And moving on to hemoglobin targets, uh, indeed, are we all on the same page? And focusing here just on the upper hemoglobin target, KDGO 2012 states that ESAs should generally not be used to maintain hemoglobin above 11.5 grams per deciliter. However, therapy can be individualized for patients um, to help to potentially help improve quality of life. Uh, for patients who are willing to accept that, those possible risks. In that context, we see quite variable uh, hemoglobin uh, upper targets. When we ask our, met, our nephrology medical uh, nephrologist at participating sites, ranging from a number of patients in Brazil with a target of 12.5 or higher to a predominant number of folks with a target of 12, which is in dark blue. But particularly in the U.S., a lot of patients who were lower than 12 at 11.5 in orange or even 11 or less uh, in light blue. So a lot of variation, uh, a lot of difference in interpretation of the guidelines with respect to what we should be aiming to treat, to, 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 uh, treat patients to. And then the question of how often is anemia treated uh, and you know, stated rather facetiously, we all treat when we should, uh, don't we? All right, this is our publication by our colleague Michelle Wong uh, using CKDOPS data across our four countries. And on the x-axis we see by hemoglobin level, just to focus on the bottom line, which is uh, in dark blue, we see that in the U.S., uh, even among patients with hemoglobin less than 10, 52% uh, of persons did not receive either ESA or oral or IV iron over three subsequent months. The performance is a bit better in countries such as Germany uh, at, at only 30%. But bottom line, marked under treatment even at very low hemoglobin levels. Dual ESA and iron use, which is in orange, is especially uncommon, um, and it's especially so in the U.S. And here we're looking at the same data, but presented by the CKD stage. And the bottom line is, again, that uh, even in advanced CKD, treatment for anemia is not the norm. And, and that's especially so uh, in the U.S. Uh, in, in fact, uh, only about a third of patients with CKD5 are, are treated for anemia. And we also see corroborative data uh, in the literature as well in this analysis of Medicare patients. Uh, among uh, patients with CKD and anemia, uh, over the course of one year, only 13% were treated with an ESA, only 7% treated with IV iron. Well, so then what are the implications of this under treatment for our patients? Uh, one of these is, is transfusions. Uh, and uh, the same Medicare analysis uh, reported that 22% of these patients were transfused over one year. And I have three corroborative studies that show similar proportion transfused as well. Uh, so we really have an obligation to do better to, to limit avoidable uh, uh, transfusions. And of course, an important implication of transfusions for patients, a very practical one is that PRA score tends to be higher and wait times for transplant do tend to be higher. And really to emphasize the problem of, of under treatment, uh, the prior data I showed were treatment within three months. This is showing uh, cumulative incidence of treatment over 12 months. Our, our colleague Marcelo Lopes uh, recently published uh, uh, these findings as well. We focus first on the top right uh, box, uh, we'll see that uh, even among patients with hemoglobin less than 10, as shown in red, only 30% uh, receive treatment with an, with an ESA over the next 12 months. Uh, if we look at the bottom left, we'll see for persons with TSAT less than 20%, treatment with oral iron uh, gets up to about 25% of persons over 12 months and treatment with the IV iron, which is in the middle, is, is, is actually under 5% over the course of one year. Well, stepping back and thinking about hemoglobin and outcomes, uh, I, I argue that within the range of 9 to 13 grams per deciliter, we ultimately don't know the optimal place for our patients to be. Uh, that range of 9 to 13 was really set by the TREAT clinical trial, now over a decade old. 
showing no advantage to ESA therapy to treat up to a target of 13 versus rescue therapy at 9. All right, well, in that context, I have a, uh, data from an observational study of ours led by Junichi Hoshino using our CKDOPS data and demonstrating that as hemoglobin level rises, physical activity rises uh, the, uh, as well. This is actually dichotomized physical activity using the rapid assessment of, phys of physical activity or RAPA uh, scale. Um, now we could look as well at, and we, we have looked at, um, you know, demonstrated that uh, EGFR uh, um, progression is slower, uh, or CKD progression is slower with higher hemoglobin, mortality risk is lower, other people have demonstrated that healthcare resource utilization is lower at higher hemoglobin as well. And of course, the problem that we have here is that in the observational setting, all of those observations may well be confounded uh, such that sick patients tend to be anemic and tend to have worse outcomes. So that's very different from the causal question, which is treatment uh, to raise hemoglobin, what effect does that really have on outcomes? And in this graphic, I actually shaded the range of 9 to 13 just to, to, to emphasize to folks that I really think within that broad range, we do not have a good clinical trial data to guide us one way or another as to where we optimally might be. So um, much work st still to do in, in, in this space. All right, well, pivoting now to the dialysis uh, period, and in particular, starting with the transition to dialysis, uh, reminding folks, again, there's an urgent need to continue to improve outcomes as patients make their transition with annualized mortality uh, over the three months uh, in the range of 25 per 100 patient years uh, still. And I say lost in translation because as I just demonstrated, uh, there's a lot of undertreatment of anemia before start and then as soon as patient, patients hit that dialysis chair, we give them a lot of medication, as I'll show you in just a moment. This uh, concept is, can, can be extended uh, well beyond anemia, as, for example, the argument uh, going on these days about the potential value of incremental or slower transition uh, to the start of dialysis itself uh, as patients transition to uh, kidney failure. So my first graphic here uh, shows data that we presented at ASN uh, uh, two years ago uh, with the x-axis showing uh, dialysis vintage or time, time since dialysis start uh, in years. And, and these are DOPS hemodialysis data comparing Japan to the US to seven European countries. We see that uh, mean hemoglobin at dialysis start is 9.5, rising very quickly to 11 to 11.5 actually in the first six months or so of dialysis. And of course, this is occurring because patients are getting a lot of uh, ESA. In fact, in the US, as shown here, we see ESA doses roughly 50% higher in the first uh, three to six months of dialysis than later on. Comparable story with intravenous iron uh, in the US uh, in green, patients are getting roughly four to five uh, total grams um, uh, of IV iron in the, within the first year of dialysis. Uh, reminder to folks that, that with current modern dialyzers, iron loss due to blood loss uh, in the dialysis circuit is probably in the range of one gram uh, per year. And so all this iron is presumably going to accumulate uh, into iron stores. And this is exactly what we see when we look at ferritin levels, which indeed uh, rise over time. Actually, in the U.S., it takes two years to rise gradually up to a plateau of uh, over 800 nanograms per ml. At the end of the day, I, you know, we just don't know the, the consequences of, of this approach, particularly, uh, again, as noted in the incident dialysis period. So, it, so it's really so important uh, and of such interest to the community if we could really understand whether it would benefit patients to have essentially a smoother management of their anemia from before starting dialysis uh, to uh, after that uh, transition period and, and with avoidance of, of a really exceptionally high uh, ESA and IV iron doses uh, at that time. All right, well, considering now prevalent hemodialysis patients, I just had two quick points. The first topic here relates to ESA hyporesponsiveness, which, which frankly is often talk about, talked about, but probably poorly understood. We'll spend a bit more time discussing this in, in the roundtable uh, 
a bit later in this session. Uh, it, what I'm showing here is one graphic from a very recent publication of ours, uh, led by Dr. Uh, Angelo Caraboyas. And here we see that uh, we isolated patients, who, uh, dialysis patients, who had a rise in CRP from less than 5 to greater than 10. And essentially, um, concurrent to that was a decline in hemoglobin levels uh, that averaged uh, 0.4 grams per deciliter, both in Japan uh, in orange and uh, in Europe uh, in, in blue. So really substantial decline in hemoglobin occurring with rise in CRP. And it's really occurring at the same time, um, at least within the context of monthly laboratory measures, um, as, is, as the, is the case in routine dialysis care. As a result, ESA dosing protocols are necessarily reactive uh, to inflammation rather than uh, uh, preemptive. And of course, this is particularly true in the US, US where we don't even uh, measure CRP routinely. The second point I wanted to make uh, regarding prevalent patients really is focusing here, here on the pivotal trial. This is a, a really excellent uh, trial uh, showing uh, iron, IV iron dosing in a proactive fashion uh, with dosing up to ferritin of, of 700. Uh, versus uh, a more reactive approach with dosing of IV iron to keep ferritin greater than 200, and actually somewhat better outcomes in patients uh, assigned to the dark blue uh, proactive arm. And but the point I wanted to make here uh, actually is that in real life clinical practice in the US, um, there are many, many centers that choose to dose patients to ferritin levels um, substantially higher than used even in the pivotal high-dose arm, um, as shown by this blue box. And actually, by contrast, in Japan, most patients, uh, most centers will dose to ferritin levels yet lower than the pivotal low-dose arm. So, uh, as wonderful as the pivotal trial is, um, uh, you know, my preference would actually be that uh, that, that uh, centers here in the U.S., for example, alter dosing protocols, if not to match pivotal than at least to approximate uh, pivotal um, 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 dosing and ultimately do our best to, as it were, balance uh, ESA and IV iron dosing uh, using the best uh, clinical trial data currently available. And last but not least, uh, one slide on anemia treatment among peritoneal dialysis patients. And the basic message here is that uh, it is variable as, as care is among hemodialysis patients. Uh, it's much yet more so for PD patients, and principally, we just don't have the data, and there's a lot more to learn. Um, this is a, uh, these are data from our perineal dialysis study, PDOPS, from five different countries, looking at facility variation in prescription of ESA, varying from fewer than 40% up to 100% of patients over four months. On the right-hand side, pr prescription of IV iron. Uh, many sites don't use it at all. Uh, on the other hand, in the U.S., there's some sites that use it uh, in the majority of, of patients. Well, we covered a, a ton of territory. I'll just wrap up with three final slides regarding, again, the current reality and challenges in anemia care. First of all, in the non-dialysis CKD setting, that many patients aren't monitored often enough for anemia or iron deficiency, and that, that is even by us uh, nephrologists. Uh, anemia is very, very common. Uh, the, uh, hemoglobin less than 10, 30% uh, of patients uh, with CKD5. Iron deficiency is really the norm uh, at roughly 50% of, of, of patients with CKD. Uh, and we, at the same time, see marked under-treatment of, of anemia and or iron deficiency. Um, as noted here, 50% uh, of, of patients in the U.S. are not treated with any iron or ESA uh, within three months after uh, a hemoglobin of less than 10, 70% don't receive an ESA within, within 12 months of hemoglobin under 10. Um, soon after starting uh, either ESA or iron therapy, most patients actually stop or change treatment. And uh, as a result of this, in part, uh, many, many patients are transfused uh, uh, approximately 20% uh, per year. In the dialysis setting, first of all, the transition to dialysis uh, care from before to after start is really quite frenetic, uh, sort of nihilistic, uh, minimalistic to all out uh, uh, with very, very high ESA doses given in the first three to six months of dialysis and in turn very high IV iron doses uh, as well. 
among prevalent patients, uh, it appears that fluctuations in ESA resistance are really quite common. Uh, and a result of this, uh, ESA dosing protocols tend to be reactive um, to inflammation rather than preemptive. Uh, in the U.S., um, IV iron dosing uh, up to a fair target of 1,200, in my view at least, uh, really ignores um, the best evidence out there, uh, uh, which would be to a ferritin in the 700 range or so. And lastly, among PD patients, ESA and IV iron use is highly variable, and optimal protocols remain uh, very much uncertain. So reasons for variation in care. Again, the guidelines tend to lack clarity, and the reason for this is that we simply have many unknowns. Remaining variable concerns about safety related to ESA and IV iron, uncertainty about optimal targets within a very broad range, uh, the hemoglobin of 9 to 12 or even 9 to 13, and frankly, the practical difficulties that we see with the current parental, parental treatments, especially for, uh, for patients in the non-dialysis uh, or home dialysis setting. So what opportunities does that leave for us? You know, number one, let's do what we can to help clarify optimal hemoglobin targets. Uh, considering both clinical and patient-reported outcomes. Let's listen to our patients, what's really important to them. Let's be willing to personalize care according to their needs. Uh, let's improve uh, what I call access to anemia medications, really meaning uh, ease of use of these medications. Um, limit transfusions, and again, let's not start dialysis before it's ready and needed. And let's do better in terms of smoothing care for patients at the transition uh, uh, to dialysis. Now with that, with that, I'll just give a special thanks to our, our, our CKDOPS partners, both in France and in Germany, uh, as noted here. And uh, thanks again to our audience for, for your attention. Well, thanks so much, Bruce, for this very comprehensive overview of the um, data, observational data, uh, looking at practice patterns in anemia management. Um, I think um, the messages are quite uh, quite clear and, and to me sometimes a bit striking, especially when it comes to the, you know, under, under treatment of patients in the non-dialysis space. You listed, you listed a few potential reasons for that. But perhaps uh, it might be nice to speak speculate a little bit more about what you consider in terms of, you know, importance of those potential reasons for uh, country variation and also reasons for treatment in general, something that you, you might consider the most important uh, issue behind it. Sure. Th thank you, Roberto. Yeah, it, it seems to me to, to be essentially a confluence of circumstances uh, to begin with. The, once again, we do have quite wide uh, hemoglobin uh, range uh, where there is, there's really a great deal of uncertainty about, uh, about optimal hemoglobin levels. And as a result in the, the, the label uh, uh, you're in, this, in the US, um, which really uh, discourages treatment uh, until hemoglobins fall below 10, um, it, 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 as one example, as a result of this, particularly in the non-dialysis space, we do see patients drifting down uh, in terms of hemoglobin levels and, and frankly does, does put them in a much substantially higher risk for transfusion. You know, we can avoid transfusions if we treat, uh, but we don't treat quite often enough. And as noted, you know, most patients really worldwide, the, the average hemoglobin at dialysis start is nine and a half. So it's really quite, quite low. Um, and then, but then secondly, in addition to these uncertainties, um, just the difficulties with the current uh, uh, paradigms, uh, treatment paradigms, treatment with, with um, um, you know, injectable uh, ESAs, uh, intravenous iron, uh, et cetera, is just very, very challenging. So I think that that confluence plays a big role in what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, and one question from the, the audience that might be yeah. interesting to approach is the, I mean, we, we do see a variation in uh, achieved uh, hemoglobin levels in, uh, in different countries. Um, do you see um, that these patients with higher hemoglobin are experienced worse uh, survival due to cardiovascular disease as you can see, for instance, in the RCTs with ESAs? Right. 
Well, it's a good uh, provocative question, so thank you. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, in the real world setting, we don't see that. Uh, so clearly, in fact, we see the opposite in the observational real world space. That is that patients with higher hemoglobin do better. And they do better with respect to patient reported outcomes, with respect to uh, uh, physical activity, um, uh, you know, slower EGFR, uh, slower loss of EGFR, and even cardiovascular outcomes. Now, the important caveat, as I say all that, is that that does not indicate that treatment to a higher hemoglobin leads to better outcomes with respect to any of those outcomes. So, um, um, so that's a very, very important point to keep in mind. I, I'm not stating that we have evidence that treatment improves outcomes. I do submit that, uh, that again, I think as noted, particularly with the, with the parameters set by TREAT, which is essentially a range of 9 to 13, there's a vast unknown with respect to ultimately what treatment can do for patients. Can treatment actually improve patients uh, in terms of either uh, how they're feeling and or potentially clinical autism? And I think we just don't know. Um, yeah. So I think there's much more to learn. Yeah. Well, thanks, Bruce. And I, I, for the sake of time, I think we'll move to the second uh, talk of this um, webinar. And I have uh, the pleasure to introduce Dr. Steve Fishbane. Um, Dr. Fishbane is the Chief Division of Nephrology at Northwell Health, and a professor of medicine at the Zucker School of Medicine in Northwell. Uh, Steve, welcome to our webinar. Looking forward to your talk. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Fishbane, and very pleased to be able to speak to you today about the HIF pH inhibitors. And is this the dawn of a new age in anemia treatment? These are my disclosures with relationship to research and consulting activities. So the HIF pathway or hypoxia inducible factors are key proteins that are located within cells of the body. And this is the way that the body essentially senses, is there enough oxygen present at any given time? And that might be a reflection of there really not being enough oxygen or being at altitude or being anemic and thereby having less oxygen delivery to tissues. But it is this system, the hypoxia inducible factor system that provides control over the body's response, the cellular response and the ability to act upon it. And an important part of that is that the system thereby becomes the central regulator of erythropoiesis. So if you're hypoxic, you would want to have more red blood cells available to carry oxygen. You would want to have more iron available. And all of that is part of the body's response when hypoxia is present. The way that this works in the HIF system is that we have oxygen sensors. So in the green box on the far left are the hypoxia inducible factor proleal hydroxylases. These are enzymes and these are sensing oxygen constantly, 24 hours a day uh, in the body. And when there's sufficient oxygen present, which is the case most of the time, they attach hydroxyl groups to these proline moieties on the HIF alpha molecule. And HIF, hypoxia inducible factor, which is constantly being produced as long as oxygen is present, is constantly being degraded but let's look at what happens in hypoxic conditions. So with hypoxia or in altitude or with anemia, the HIF pH uh, enzymes are cut off and they will not then hydroxylate the proline groups on HIF alpha. So HIF alpha now is not touched and it is allowed to survive. It's not degraded and it will translocate to the nucleus of the cell where 
HIF alpha and its brother, if you will, HIF beta dimerize. And this hetero dimerization allows for a number of different genes to be activated. And in that activation, you get production of a variety of different proteins that are going to be helpful for the cellular response to hypoxia. So inhibition of the HIF prolohydroxylases is possible pharmacologically. And indeed, medications are being developed in order to try to inhibit these enzymes to stabilize HIF alpha and to get that response to hypoxia by creating a pseudo hypoxic environment. If you block the enzyme, you allow HIF alpha to survive. And like living at altitude, it allows for the production of erythropoietin or iron molecules, which are key for the carriage of oxygen to tissues. So right now there are three of these agents that are being developed, Roxadustat, Vatadustat, and Dapridustat. And these are the three agents, and you see here the effective doses that were used in phase two. The dosing schedule, so Let's uh, make here the important point that these are oral medications. Up until this point, what we have used in terms of anemia treatment has been intravenous or sub-Q EPO. These are oral, so uh, these are interesting in that way. Roxadustat is a three times a week oral administration. Vatadustat, Dapridustat have been primarily tested as once daily treatments, although uh, Vatadustat is currently being studied as a three times a week medication. The half-life is a little bit longer for Roxadustat than the other agents. Um, and in terms of the specific effects, metabolism, I, I won't go into it here, but in fact, these are not exactly the same molecules and they may have slightly different effects which could end up being clinically important. So let's start to look at study results. And for this purpose, I will focus on phase three. Phase two for these drugs all show that efficacy looked like uh, it was good or the drugs wouldn't have made it into phase three. But we'll start with a study of Roxadustat, and this was from China. So you'll see here a comparison in the blue line of placebo and the hemoglobin level in the green line for Roxadustat. And indeed, you see that there's a brisk erythropoietic response with hemoglobin rising nicely with Roxadustat treatment in comparison to placebo. In this study, they also look at the effect of hepcidin. And for placebo, of course, hepcidin doesn't really change, but it's quite fascinating that the HIF-PHI drugs have this remarkable effect. And here with Roxadustat, you see a decrease in hepcidin from almost 100 to about 50, so about a 50% decrease in hepcidin. And that has a lot of potentially salutary effects in terms of iron mobility that we'll come back to. So that was from a relatively small phase three study from China. Roxadustat has completed its full phase three global program. And this slide shows the effects of pooled data from the non-dialysis study. So these are office chronic kidney disease patients. And if we look here, for example, we'll see that in these placebo controlled trials, the red line being placebo and the hemoglobin in the blue line here for Roxadustat. And just as we saw in the Chinese uh, study, we see a really brisk response for hemoglobin uh, that's quite impressive. Now, when we look at patients, depending on whether they're iron replete or iron non-replete, so this has always been a bugaboo with EPO drugs that the ESAs traditionally don't work as well in patients that are not iron replete. But uh, I thought it was particularly interesting that when you pull these studies with 4,000 patients, that the net effect in terms of the increase in hemoglobin in iron replete patients with Roxadustat 
and iron non-replete patients is exactly the same. And I think that's a uh, potentially really helpful property of HIF PHIs and specifically here for that, that it works apparently just as well in patients whether they're iron replete or non-replete. Now, there were no patients in the study that were severely iron deficient, and we wouldn't know about that population. Here, we look at the dialysis population. So now, this is a pool of three large studies, and looking at the hemoglobin change over time, the red line is for the ESAs, a poet and alpha for the most part here, and you see the hemoglobin concentration compared to the blue line for roxadustat. And for roxadustat here with uh, over 3,800 patients, you see results in terms of an increase in hemoglobin that would best be described as being non-inferior to the EPO comparator. So on conversion or on initiation, it works just as well as uh, EPO, and in fact, it turns out to be numerically even a bit greater, so that uh, the term superiority perhaps could be used for this hemoglobin response. Now, here we look um, in two different states. So let's first look at an inflamed patient, and this is a really interesting population because we have a lot of patients that are EPO hyporesponsive, and usually as a result of inflammation, we can't get an optimal response. And again, I find here something really interesting, that when you look at uh, this table, this figure on the right, for patients with CRP levels that are below the upper limit of normal, and let's say that those are patients that are presumably not inflamed, compared to patients in this figure on the left where the CRP levels are elevated, you'll see that the red vertical bars, the increase in hemoglobin with roxadustat is exactly the same practically in both groups. So even with inflammation present, you see that uh, again, there is that same nice effect. Now turning to iron. So before we talked about the potential for greater iron availability, and that uh, immediately raises the question, well, what about intravenous iron treatment? Is it possible that that might be decreased with HIF PHI treatment? And indeed, what they showed us here in the pool of these 3,800 patients, that in fact, the need for intravenous iron in the blue line for roxadustat compared to the red line for um, EPO controls was reduced by about 11%. So there was a decrease in the need for intravenous iron. Let's look at rescue therapies. So patients uh, were allowed to be rescued from the control groups, particularly important in the placebo studies. So the first two graphs here are the non-dialysis studies. And we look uh, here for the general use of rescue therapy. You see it's about 8% with roxadustat approximately 31% with placebo, so about an 80% reduction in the need for any rescue therapy. Regarding blood transfusion, so this is particularly important because of the risks of allosensitization that go along with red cell transfusion. And you see that in the non-dialysis studies with roxadustat compared to placebo, 15% of placebo patients in the first 52 weeks of study compared to 5% with ROXA needed blood transfusion. Uh, it's a reduction of 74%. So a helpful decrease there. Uh, interesting, in this figure on the far right, we're looking at the dialysis population. So now the comparison is ROXA do stat compared to EPO. And in fact, here as well, you see that there was a decrease in the need for blood transfusion. So we saw hemoglobin looked like it was a little bit higher numerically with roxadustat in the dialysis studies. And in fact, that's reflected by uh, a slightly lesser need for blood transfusion as well. Now, looking up at other outcomes, if we're looking at uh, non-dialysis patients, we're of course gonna be interested in understanding progression of kidney disease. 
So we're looking at here a change in GFR in the first year of therapy. The blue line is change in GFR for Roxadustat, and the red line is change in GFR and placebo. And what we see here is that, in fact, there is a difference. It's not a large difference. It's 1.6 mLs per minute over the course of a year. It's interesting. We would like, I think, to know more about this. This could be a potentially really important finding. Haven't seen a lot of detail. We definitely need to know a lot more about this one, but provocative, real interesting start. LDL cholesterol. And just about every one of the rocks that do that study shows the same thing, which is whether dialysis or non-dialysis patients, that LDL cholesterol drops in a meaningful way. And here you see in the non-dialysis studies where drops in LDL cholesterol could have particularly important effects in terms of cardiovascular events. A reduction of 17 points in LDL with Roxadustat compared to essentially no change with placebo. So interesting. Now let's look at cardiovascular safety. And ultimately, because of the cardiovascular safety issues with EPO drugs, this is the most important part of the analysis. And we start with the non-dialysis pool for Roxadustat. And in this large pool of patients, we see that starting with over 4,000 patients, that the lines are virtually superimposable. In fact, when we look at the point estimates, they are slightly higher, but there's no statistical difference between Roxadustat or placebo in MACE, MACE plus or all-cause mortality in the non-dialysis studies in the dialysis pool studies. So again, this is that large pool of three studies with 3,800 patients. We see that for MACE events, um, essentially there is non-inferiority demonstrated between Roxadustat and EPO. For MACE plus events, there is a bit of an advantage with Roxadustat that's statistically significant. And all-cause mortality, uh, the line crosses one. So there's no statistical difference. So we see there um, a little bit of a trend, uh, but particularly in MACE plus, and I'll call your attention to the bottom here, congestive heart failure, one of the endpoints in MACE plus reduced from 8.6% with a POET and alpha to 6.2% with Roxadustat. We'll uh, certainly be interested in understanding that finding better. In the incident dialysis population, so this is that difficult, chaotic to take care of the first three or four months of dialysis. Look at the outcomes here for Roxadustat compared to EPO in the dialysis studies. You see that in the incident population, there was a real advantage here for Roxadustat compared to EPO. For MACE events, about a 30% reduction. MACE plus about a 34% reduction. And all-cause mortality, there is a trend, but this actually doesn't reach statistical significance. <clears throat> Looking at MACE plus events over time, you see that you start to get a spread after about six months in the incident patients. And as they continue on dialysis, you see some spreading of that as time goes by. So an interesting finding of improved cardiovascular safety uh, outcomes with Roxadustat compared to EPO in the incident dialysis population. Now we're going to move from Roxadustat, and uh, we've just started to get phase three results for Vatidustat. So this is the Vatidustat dialysis uh, studies, the Innovate, two uh, really nicely done studies in incident and prevalent dialysis populations. You see that the hemoglobin concentrations for Vatidustat in blue compared to Darbopoet and alpha in red are about equal in the prevalent dialysis population. Again, non-inferiority uh, demonstrated over the course of time. When we look at cardiovascular safety for Vatidustat in the dialysis population, we see here clean results that for the different um, groups that we're looking at, the hazard ratios you see are close to 0 0.95, 0 0.96. Uh, 
uh, clear demonstration for cardiovascular safety of that adduced stat being not inferior to DARPA poetin alpha. The vatidustat PROTECT study is a study um, done with vatidustat in um, patients uh, prior um, to dialysis. So this is the non-dialysis office CKD population. You see here that the hemoglobin concentrations are uh, quite similar between vatidustat and darbapoidin. So note, compared to roxidustat where there was a pl placebo comparator, this is a comparison of vatidustat to darbapoidin. Really nice hemoglobin response, essentially clean demonstration of non-inferiority. What becomes tricky here is that in the vatidustat non-dialysis data compared to darbapoidin and alpha, the MACE outcome um, was uh, at a point estimate of 1.17. It is statistically significantly higher for vatidustat than for darbapoidin alpha. The other outcomes, there appears to be a bit of a trend, but nothing that is statistically significant. And particularly important, cardiovascular mortality, there's not a difference. Uh, this difference in MACE events will certainly need to understand better and uh, be, I'm sure, a lot of analysis on this subject in the weeks ahead. When you look at the PROTECT study by region, and this is where things become tantalizing and confusing, that that increase in the MACE outcome was seen in the non-US population where the um, point estimate was 1.29 versus the US where it was 1.01. And that was true for pretty much all of these outcomes. That's going to be uh, really interesting to dissect and to try to understand better. Finally, DAPRO do stat. Interesting study that is just a bit behind in terms of development, but we have this phase three study that was recently reported from Japan. 271 hemodialysis patients randomized to darbapoidin or to dapridustat. And over the course of a year of follow-up, a nice hemoglobin response that was similar between the two groups, 10.8 and 10.9. So a demonstration for non-inferiority. The number of patients at hemoglobin target, 90% and similar results in terms of adverse events, a uh, little trend for DARPA poet and alpha being slightly higher um, in this group, but a nice demonstration for efficacy um, in terms of non-inferiority and for safety, uh, it would take a little bit of a larger study and we'll certainly look forward uh, to those results. So in summary, the HIF-PHI drugs are an oral class of anemia, class treatments, of anemia treatments that have all very clearly, clearly demonstrated clear. efficacy. We have seen some side effects um, in the early studies, um, which we'll need to understand. There's been a little bit of hyperkalemia seen in the Chinese Roxadustat studies that were not seen at all in this huge 9,000 patient phase three program. We saw the vatidustat increase in MACE events that we'll need to understand better. Some of the side aspects which are interesting of these drugs are the effects with iron. And we saw a lot of this with roxadustat and a decrease in the need for intravenous iron. The ability to work in potentially inflamed and EPO-HYPO-responsive patients and then what is the meaning of the drop in LDL cholesterol? Is that something that we could lever clinically. And then in terms of safety, cardiovascular safety has now been looked at, I think, really well for roxadustat and vatidustat. We get results here that um, are interesting. The roxadustat results uh, look like they're fairly clean for non-dialysis and the dialysis population. The vatidustat uh, results in the Innovate study in dialysis, very clean need to understand better what happened in the PROTECT study in non-dialysis patients and why there would have been a difference seen there in terms of MACE events. What's not fully established are things like, could there potentially be a risk for malignancy in terms of long-term treatment? It's a question that's been asked. We'll want to understand that with longer view of patients, including after potential FDA approval. 
and then other potential um, outcomes as well that might not be anticipated. And that's always a potential with new drugs. Thank you very much for your participation and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks. Thanks very much, Steve. Can you hear me well? I sure do. Thank you, Roberto. All right. So we have uh, lots of questions from the audience. I'll take a couple of those and, and uh, I hope you don't mind by uh, if, uh, answering some of them in the chat, um, just, just so we can go back in track in terms of the time and allow time for the discussions of the round table. Well, one interesting question here from Matthew Robbins is, is related to the uh, how do the doses of ESA compare in ROXA studies to the Vadadustat studies? Right, so that's going to be an interesting question to understand better. Uh, at this time, it's very early in terms of looking at Vadadustat data so that we um, haven't seen publicly anything in terms of the EPO doses in the Vadadustat studies. Remember, DARPA potent alpha was the comparator drug uh, in those studies, so that it'll be a little bit hard to compare that to the potent that was used in the ROXA juice that studies. But it is a good question and an important one because part of what we're going to need to be able to establish better is just what the relationship was to EPO exposure. So I appreciate what is a good and important question. Well, thanks very much. And another one, maybe this is a quick one, uh, from Ming Zhu. Uh, what are the MACE rates in ROXA versus placebo adjusted for hemoglobin levels? Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, of course, you have both crude results, which are just the results as they are, then you have adjusted results for various covariates and baseline patient characteristics. Oh, thanks very much, Steve. Um, I think for the sake of time, we will move to the next session. I'll just um, pass the mic to uh, Bruce Robinson, who's going to be chairing the next uh, roundtable discussion. Bruce? Very good, uh, Roberto. Thank you. Uh, and Steve as well. Thank you so very much. So we, we spent uh, the, the first 15 minutes of this talk. Uh, first of all, I reviewed the sort of the state of current care in the real world with respect to anemia. Lots of unanswered questions, lots of room to improve. And then Steve has done just great reviewing the, the current status with respect to clinical trials. So, so I do appreciate that. We have a, a, a wonderful um, panel here for a roundtable discussion that I'm really very excited uh, uh, to, 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 to get going here in just a moment. Um, so in addition to Steve, who's of course from the US and, and uh, with, with his uh, uh, vast knowledge as well as of the, of the current uh, phase three uh, clinical trials. Roberto, um, representing actually the Brazilian perspective, uh, speaking to us today from Curitiba uh, in, in Brazil. We also have from around the world uh, uh, three other uh, guests uh, with us. Uh, first is uh, Alex Casis. Uh, Alex, uh, Dr. Casis is an associate professor, senior consultant in nephrology at the University of Barcelona in Spain. Uh, he has very active research and clinical career among his uh, numerous activities is a member of the anemia uh, work group at the Spanish Society of Nephrology and as well a country investigator uh, for the DOP study with us uh, in, in Spain. Uh, secondly, from Beijing, uh, 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 Professor uh, 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 Li Zhuo, uh, who is director of the nephrology department at Peking University's People Hospital in Beijing. And again, with a really vast um, sort of academic research and and uh, clinical portfolio. Uh, Professor Zhou is also president of the Blood Purification Committee of the Chinese Research Hospital Association, lead country investigator for our DOP study in China. And then uh, additionally, from uh, speaking to us, uh, coming to us from, from Japan, uh, Tokyo, uh, Masayomi Nangaku is vice dean 
and head of the Division of Nephrology and Endocrinology at the University of Tokyo Graduate School of Medicine. Uh, he is currently the president of the Asian Pacific Society of Nephrology. He has actually his leadership roles on numerous other uh, major medical um, societies, uh, including the uh, currently deputy chair for research work group for the International Society of Nephrology. Uh, and I'll note that Dr. Nangaku he is also on the steering committee for our Japan DOP study. Uh, so with those introductions, uh, we'll, we'll launch the round table. And, okay, good. So I, I just have three, uh, in terms of uh, the, the content that we'll cover, um, I'm gonna, for, this is actually very exciting and hopefully for, for, the, for the international community because of HIP, you know, the HIP pH inhibitors have actually been approved in China as well as Japan now for over a year. And so it's gonna be really interesting to hear of the experiences in the real world to date uh, from both of those countries. And then we'll hear reactions from our other panelists uh, we'll spend some time then thinking about gaps, questions, studies needed related to safety, dosing, uh, et cetera, and then, and then finally some concluding remarks. Now, just a note again for the audience, um, the, the, the round we have uh, uh, about you know, 30, 35 minutes here. We won't be addressing questions directly from the audience within the round table, but are happy, really very happy to, to receive your questions. And to respond to them as quickly as quickly as we can uh, uh, offline uh, as well. Okay. With that said, uh, I'd love to. Uh, really interested in hearing the initial experiences with the HIPPH inhibitors uh, uh, in China and Japan. If, if we could start with the experience uh, in China, um, uh, Professor Zhuo. Uh, Okay, so I'm not I'm not hearing the audio yet. Yeah, uh, Joel, I, I'm not. Uh, maybe we could, uh, Professor Joel. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, I'm not not hearing your audio. Okay, so now, so now it's okay. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, so. Okay, so I will for thank you for the excellent presentation. So you know, in China, the HPHI uh, Roxna is uh, commercially available in the year 2018, and is uh, covered by medical insurance uh, thereafter. So this drug is approved um, uh, in use in CKD patients uh, are not on dialysis and maintenance hemodialysis patients. Um, uh, the, in, 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 in the initial do dosage, in the use of this drug, we have some experience that, uh, you know, in the, in the discretion of the drug, it decides that the initial dose should be one milligram per kilogram body weight. Uh, that is about a 70 milligram for a normal size uh, CKD patient. So, but um, actually in our clinical practice, we think that uh, especially in CKD, no, not on dialysis, uh, especially those uh, with uh, residual renal function, like in CKD stage 3B or 4, uh, usually, they do not need such a, a, a dose like one milligram per kilogram, uh, maybe 50 milligram per each other day will uh, work well to correct the, the hemoglobin level to an uh, acceptable level. So this is CKD non-dialysis patients. In PD patients and the CKD patients non-dialysis, they usually, uh, it's very easy to change from um, injection ESA, uh, ESA, uh, to KPHI. 
because they, they do not need to, to make injection uh, every uh, three or four times per week. Uh, but in maintaining the hemodialysis patients, uh, some of the patients in my center, and, and the, uh, the practice part may not dif make difference. In my centers, do not, they are reluctant to change from injection to uh, oral PHI because the oral PHI, they think that uh, they increase their the dose burden. But in some patients, like in uh, maintaining the hemodialysis patients, if the patient do not respond well to ESA, the doctors usually uh, discuss with the patient to change from ESA to HIPHI. And uh, in this kind of patients, we found that uh, most of the patient can still work well to, to respond well with HIPHI, but uh, with relatively larger adults compared with the earlier CKD patients. Uh, this is our experience. And uh, in use of this drug, we also found that uh, uh, if the patient have uh, do not have uh, uh, absolute iron deficiency, usually we do not need to make iron supplement. Uh, we just uh, gain enough iron uh, from the food, that will be enough. But in patients with absolute and iron deficiency, we still have to, to make iron supplement. Um, uh, also, we found that uh, the patient, if the patient have some um, inflammation uh, in, in inflammation stage, also patient can respond well from this drug. Uh, this is our fund. And also, uh, we found that uh, it's a scent, just a scent. We do not do data analysis. Some centers may have this kind of uh, feeling that uh, the patient may uh, reduce their anti hypersensitive drug use. Uh, this may be because they do not have to have the serum um, uh, ESA level very high when uh, making the ESA injection. Um, uh, although the, the drug is uh, marketed uh, for more than one year, uh, a lot of experience should begin to say uh, the long-term uh, outcome of, in our patients. So. Uh, some uh, phase four studies is undergoing because we know from the mechanism, we know that uh, if PHI can promote um, iron absorption in the GI tract, and uh, uh, also the dose may be different in CKD early stage and in patients on, on renal replacement therapy. So the, dose, the, the proper dose in different stage of CKD is also in phase four study. And uh, also, some real world data is collecting uh, to make uh, sure that the drug will, in real world, will benefit our patients of uh, renal anemia. Uh, although, um, yes, you know that the first uh, phase three published is in China. So, the first upon, uh, 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 commercialized is also in China. Uh, uh, but uh, a lot of work needs to be done. And uh, you you know that uh, the Chinese Society of of um, uh, Nephrology is drafting a recommendation for uh, renal anemia management. Uh, two or three years ago, we have a, a renal anemia management recommendation from the society. And because of the new commercialization of the new drug, so they are making um, um, uh, making change of the the anemia recommendation two years ago. So I hope that the drug will really do good for our patients in the long run. Thank you. This is our some uh, here we share some experience from from our country. Thank you. Hello, you don't hear me? Yeah. I think we can't hear you, Bruce. Um, thanks very much, uh, Jolie. Maybe Masaomi, uh, you could actually add some of your perception from the Japan's perspective. Uh, thank you, Roberto. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, Roxadastat was first approved uh, last year, and currently uh, three other drugs have already been approved in Japan: uh, Daprodostat, Vadadastat, and Enardostat. So we have four different drugs available at the bedside, uh, both for 
HD patients and uh, dialysis patients and non-dialysis dependent CKD patients. Uh, we have a rough estimation of the prescription of, of the uh, pH inhibitor to dialysis patients. We have uh, 340,000 dialysis patients in Japan, and we estimate more than 20,000 patients are using HIF pH inhibitors in Japan at this moment. So uh, that's our experience, and we can discuss about uh, the other points with you. Thank you, Roberto. Right, and actually, I'm now now unmuted. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very very much. So so really interesting. So first of all, in in uh, uh, the Beijing experience uh, that Professor Zhuo is, uh, um, it sounds as if the use of, of Roxadustat, which is the only HIF stable HIF, HIF pH inhibitor approved as yet in Japan, in China, um, is, is use is actually quite common among non-dialysis CKD patients and peritoneal dialysis patients, um, and use, to my understanding, in the range of about 10% of in-center hemodialysis patients, and, and in that case, particularly uh, folks who are who tend to be ESA resistant. Um, that said, um, Professor Zhou, I do understand that this depends a lot on on the nephrologist and the and the, the clinical site. I mean, some such as yours are have become quite comfortable in use, whereas others are are using less frequently. Um, and in uh, in Japan, it did, uh, Professor Nagaku, uh, quite quite amazing that, again, to hear quite uh, substantial uptake, uh, particularly in the dialysis setting. Of course, most dialysis patients are in-center hemodialysis uh, in, in, in Japan. Um, um, it, we anticipate uptake, it sounds, in the non-dialysis space as well, uh, coming soon. And also remarkable that there are indeed for um, HIF pH inhibitors uh, approved for use currently in Japan. So interested in uh, just quick, just very quickly in perspectives from the, the three others uh, among, around the world, actually, um, um, uh, Dr. Cases from Spain, any, any quick thoughts uh, or reactions? Uh, well, with respect to uh, what, uh, what what are expectations in Europe, we have to say that we don't have uh, data. Uh, uh, that these drugs have not been approved in in in, in Europe. In fact, uh, I know that uh, Roxadustat has sent the files for approval in May 2020, but don't, 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 they don't have data. They, they don't have the approval so far. And we have, uh, we don't, uh, as far as I know, both the pro the produce that and the produce that have not been uh, sent for approval to the EMA. So uh, we have to wait for the for the approval before starting with uh, these drugs. Right. Thank you. Then and, and uh, just again for the international audience, Steve, if you could tell us where we are in in the approval process or expectation in, in the state. Yeah. So in the United States right now, uh, Roxadustat has been under review by the Food and Drug Administration, and December 20th is uh, the requirement date for them to provide approval uh, or non-approval based on their review. And we would expect marketing of Roxadustat uh, sometime if it's approved in the first or second quarter of 2021. And uh, it'll be very, very interesting to see how it's taken up. I was really interested to hear about uh, Professor Nagaku's uh, experience in Japan and Professor Lee's experience in China, a little bit different. Thank you very much. And, and then uh, uh, Dr. Pequa, uh, can you tell us uh, about the Brazilian uh, expectations? Yeah, Brazil and also Latin America participated in all, all of the trials, uh, both non-dialysis and dialysis, had a, had a nice participation in those. The community is uh, quite excited about it. But um, as uh, you may expect, you know, in low resource areas, you know, cost issues and, you know, the true 
an a broader analysis of the comparisons between the current standard treatments and the new treatments and how this would affect uh, affect in outcomes will be needed in the discussions for a broader introduction in the region. Indeed, indeed, thank you. Uh, yeah, cost permitting, of course, down the road, this may be a really uh, uh, important therapy, of course, for the folks in lower uh, resource settings, uh, cost permitting, that is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, right. Uh, th thank you. Thank you all. So, if we could then pivot now to uh, discussions, uh, actually, the second bullet, uh, gaps, questions, studies needed. Um, and uh, before launching in, to those uh, for for Dr. Casis, I was curious uh, your just sort of your level of comfort, as it were, and what what, what sort of additional data are you looking for um, as you as you in, in the near term will start to consider the the role for HIF uh, pH inhibitors in in your clinic. Uh, hi, Alex. Uh, we actually can't. We can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry for yeah. to unmute me. Uh, yeah. uh, the problem is that uh, we have data. Uh, we rely only on data from medical congresses, but uh, we don't have data from peer-reviewed publication in general. But I would say I feel reasonably comfortable with the results that we have so far, especially with uh, Roxadus, that with the data from the bullet analysis and non-dialysis and dialysis uh, CKD patients showing non-inferiority with respect to cardiovascular safety uh, with compared with placebo or with isabos in non-dialysis and dialysis-dependent CKD patients. Further, the results on blood pressure, the risk of hypertensive episodes, the risk of neoplasia, and retinal problems uh, seen in the phase three trials and the results presented at the ASN 2020 are reassuring. Although, especially in the case of neoplasma, as Dr. Fishman has mentioned, we need data for longer follow-ups. The fact that these drugs are orally active and require less iron, especially IV iron, are appealing, especially in the non-hemodialysis setting. On the other hand, we need the data on other complications of potential concerns, such as the risk of hyperkalemia seen in some, but not all other studies, as mentioned by Dr. Fishbein, thrombotic events, arteriovenous fistula thrombosis, or CKD progression in the case of non-dialysis patients when compared with this, among others. Uh, on the other hand, we, not, we must uh, recognize that patients in randomized controlled trials in general are a relatively selected and healthier population, so we also will need uh, data on a uh, real-world population, but so far I feel quite comfortable. Indeed, right. Good, good. Thank, yeah, thank you for that summary. Of course, a number of questions, uh, in many cases looking, of course, for longer-term safety data. Um, um, uh, uh, but those signals to date have been generally, generally favorable. With that said, though, I did want to pivot uh, and ask uh, uh, Dr. Fishbein. Actually, uh, first of all, Steve, if you could um, give us any sense as to when you anticipate um, peer-reviewed publications to start to come out, because of course the community is uh, waiting very eagerly for those. We've heard great uh, and important data at, at, at the international congresses. Uh, but would love to see the peer-reviewed uh, publications, as, as Dr. Case has mentioned. And then, secondly, Steve, um, if you could speak to the the the, uh, the in your talk, you did talk about the MACE uh, signal uh, with Vedutistat in the Protect study in the NDD setting. Just wanted to talk and you know, sort of dive into that a bit more in a bit more detail in terms of the implications more more broadly. Thank sure. You. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so your first question was about expectation in terms of peer-reviewed publications. And, um, you know, as an author on several of those publications, uh, I, I do have awareness on the subject, but actually probably am on better ground not commenting in terms of um, when to expect it. You will see activity very soon. I think we'll leave it at that. 
Uh, in terms of this very interesting and troubling finding with respect to Vatidustat, so let me remind the audience that Vatidustat conducted this very nicely designed and conducted phase three global program that in dialysis was called the Innovate program. And we get back these uh, really great results that in terms of efficacy, everything is very straightforward in terms of the drug, in terms of safety, looking specifically at cardiovascular safety. And remember now, because of the history of safety issues with ESA drugs, the regulatory authorities around the world have uh, paid particular attention and put a great deal of vigilance on designing these phase three programs to look very carefully and to be powered. And to the extent that trials are able to really elucidate what the cardiovascular safety of drugs are, these studies are well designed to do that. So we've got the dialysis studies for Vatidustat where cardiovascular safety compared to, a po compared to DARVA poet and alpha shows clean, clear, non-inferiority, not even a hint of any issue at all. And then surprise, we get the PROTECT studies, which are similar studies, comparison to DARVA, POET, and ALPHA, but now we're looking at the non-dialysis, so the CKD, the office kidney disease population, those same people who are gonna be dialysis patients potentially in the future, and looking at a very well-conducted program. And here we get uh, this surprise finding that in terms of major adverse cardiovascular events, in fact, there is an increase in events with Vatidustat compared to DARVA Uh The hazard ratio is 1.17, and the 95% confidence intervals go beyond what the study design has allowed in terms of a description of non-inferiority. So by definition, then, the study, at least in its first uh, explication that we have seen indicates inferiority in the non-dialysis population. But then you have to start asking some questions, which is that in the dialysis population where you would expect there to be the greatest challenge, challenge the greatest opportunity to see if there is something fundamentally about the drug that uh, would expose risk, that you would see it in that dialysis population, and at least a hint of it, it's something, right, that points to the possibility that there is an issue in terms of safety, and there is nothing at all there. Uh, you then see this uh, surprising finding. Now, look, we have not been, um, not a lot of the data has been shared with us. We've seen a small amount, so we'll be cautious, I think, if uh, we're wise in terms of anything we say here. But in looking at the non-United States versus the United States data, and these are not small samples, this is over 1,500 patients in both groups, that there's a point estimate for the hazard. So I think it's 1.29, so about a 29% greater risk for vatidustat compared to darba in, in the non-US patients, and in about the same sample size in the US, there's basically no difference, 1.01. And as you slice and dice in studies, you start to get results that can be a little bit funny looking, but this one is just too striking that there is absolutely no finding of safety risk in the US population, that in the dialysis populations, you don't see any risk at all. And although there are, there's a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of places that I would be thinking in terms of where to look for an explanation, I am starting to get the sense that, look, when you do these studies, what you end up with are confidence intervals. And there's a 95% chance that you have a result that's within a certain um, range. 
I think this is going to turn out to be um, an unlucky result that is going to make for a very difficult regulatory pathway going forward. But I will simply end my comments here by saying that it really needs a lot of additional analysis. We haven't even seen a full explanation of the components of the composite endpoints. So there's a lot to be, a lot of work still to be done here. Steve, thank you, thank you. Right, and of course, where we are with it, with that particular uh, the challenge uh, with that particular study doesn't per se uh, put a damper across the class by any stretch, or even Badudistat uh, in in other studies. So I think more than anything, and and also in our discussions that that we've had um, uh, it, 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 as a group, it seems generally there's certainly interest and curiosity in what went on there, uh, but not per se a ton of concern. And instead, generally speaking, some optimism. Um, I, I would say, and, and as folks have noted, of course, as with any new class of drugs, we, we're really going to be very keen to follow up longer term safety. And that's absolutely requisite. But this is uh, uh, out of an abundance of caution, appropriately so, and not per se widespread concern, as it were. Um, in the interest of time, if we could pivot now to the to the question of iron and electric, like uh, Dr. Bacqua to speak to this. Uh, just, just to note very quickly, I've heard from both Professor uh, Zhuo and, and, uh, and Dr. Nangaku uh, in China and Japan, respectively, that both of you are asking um, uh, patients to be repleted with iron if they're indeed, if they indeed have absolute iron deficiency. Um, uh, yeah, um, but, but I, I think before or concurrent, before or concurrent with start of a HIF uh, pizza inhibitor. With that, in that context, uh, Roberto, what, what what additional thoughts might you have? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I think it's it's becoming clear from the RCT data, and also um, from real world experience, like we heard from Asami and Lee, that you know that, that appears that patients respond with erythropoiesis at levels of iron storage much lower than um, would, would, would we see in the current uh, treatment paradigm. Uh, my, my experience as, a, as an investigator in this trial has also been very similar. We really see patients at lower iron storage levels responding with very impressive erythropoiesis, uh, which is really, you know, in general what the, what the RCT data is showing. So I do think that there, there might be a, a need for a revision of the current um, recommendations for not only for you know monitoring, but perhaps for the level that the finite repletion in the pre-treatment phase. And I think the you know the the, the Asian Pacific guidelines are starting to to approach that. And I, I mean, we have Masomi here here who was part of that. I think he would be the right person to to actually. Um, you know, provide this this information, but I think what we see in there in in those recommendations is starting to you know shape up the way that we the recommendations would look in the future. And Noma, so I mean, if you want to comment on on the particular recommendations that you guys wrote. And uh, thank you, Roberto. Uh, the Asian Pacific Society of Nephrology uh, just published the recommendations of proper use of HIF pH inhibitor, and if you do. Google search with the uh, keywords of APSN, HIF, and recommendations, you can easily find it and download it without any costs. So please check it. And we strongly recommend to check Aryan before starting HIF pH inhibitor and replete Aryan enough before start of HIF pH inhibitor because uh, HIF pH inhibitor enhances Aryan usage iron utilization efficiency and lowers serum iron, which may be associated with an increase in thrombosis and embolism, which we observed in a certain uh, trials of uh, HIF pH inhibitor in Japan. So that is why we are strongly recommended to uh, replete iron in case of use of this reagent. Thank you. Yeah. And it's interesting too, by myself, to, to see the levels of T-set and ferritin that are recommended, which I think reflects already some kind of changes, right, with the T-set of 20% and the ferritin of 100, which is, mm -hmm. I think, very interesting recommendation. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
in Japan, uh, we uh, usually hesitated to use iron. Uh, I think that is a strange custom compared with other parts of the world. Uh, but we are now changing our uh, attitude and trying to replete iron. Yeah, yeah, and of course, you, you know, of course, it, w one would replete iron before starting in ESA uh, anyway, of course. So that's quite comparable. As we're, we're really very much at, at, at the end of our session. Uh, Steve um, and then Alex, uh, just a very quick comment on where you might see us in one year with respect to, with respect to HIF uh, pH inhibitor use. Uh, well, in, with respect to Europe, I I, yeah. I, I think that uh, we are going to have uh, at the, in the in the clinical practice the possibility to use these drugs, and I am I'm, I will be very happy to see how they perform in our patients in the real world practice. Thank you. Very good, and Steve. United States, uh, I believe that in the non-dialysis office population, there probably should be widespread use of HIF PHIs unless there's further um, issues that come up. And um, But insurance issues are very important there. Dialysis, I think we'll see pilots so that there'll be use in the large dialysis organizations and smaller organizations as well. Uh, there's certain specific uh, reimbursement issues which are called TDAPA, which are important in the United States and will lever a lot of the decisions, but will certainly be fascinating. It's really interesting to look ahead over the next year. Uh, it, absolutely. Really exciting time, isn't it, for particularly for our patients, right, as we actually, uh, as this new and really important new therapy comes on board. Great to hear of the utilization already in China and Japan, and really a lot to follow up on. Um, I just wanted to know for the attendees, thank you so much for, for, for your participation. And I think most importantly, everybody, please uh, be safe as we, as, we get, uh, as we continue through the COVID pandemic and perhaps, perhaps with an end uh, coming into sight at least uh, uh, sometime in, in 2021. Um, so please be, be very safe, everybody. Just a note um, that one can receive CME credits uh, as, as uh, per, um, per the slide here. And with that, we'll wrap things up. And thank you once again to all of our panelists and, and to the audience. Uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you.